It's a time of changes. Now is the time to move on. This is the time for solutions. Feel the motion. Green you is warm. Arrancamos la última sesión de esta segunda jornada desde el plató de Mobility, desde donde les saludamos, también en concreto desde el edificio del Factory en Barcelona, donde se está celebrando esta quinta edición del Barcelona New Economy Week. En esta nueva sesión lo que vamos a hablar es de las sinergias que hay entre corporaciones y startups para seguir avanzando hacia esa movilidad sostenible, cómo estos modelos de negocio pueden dar pues eh, al menos soluciones a esta nueva movilidad que tenemos eh, delante y también hacia esta nueva economía. Las corporaciones, por ejemplo, pues van encontrando en las startups, como decíamos, este complemento perfecto para seguir avanzando y si nos fijamos en los datos, de hecho se estima que las startups del sector de la movilidad captaron más de 60.000 millones de dólares en inversión global a nivel mundial, estamos hablando en 2022, con lo cual estos datos lo que reflejan es que hay un interés a estas propuestas disruptivas para seguir avanzando en este sentido y que las colaboraciones están funcionando. Los vehículos eléctricos también cada vez eh, pues hay más implantación, hay más matriculaciones. Eh, tenía datos de 10 millones de unidades vendidas en 2023 y gran parte es por esas iniciativas que también impulsan pues, tanto las corporaciones como las startups, startups. Así que sin más dilación vamos a empezar esta sesión. Quiero agradecer a los ponentes su presencia hoy aquí y pues, pues estamos también expectantes de aquello que nos vayáis a ir desgranando en este sentido. Y a Raúl Feliu, gracias por moderar también esta, esta sesión. Eh, él es manager de programas de startups en IT Urban Mobility, así que os dejo con él. Y adelante, que ya me han, ya me han chivado que tenéis muchos temas a tratar, así que adelante. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here with this session, collaboration between startups and corporates, new business models. So this, um, the good part of it is that the ones that you're here and the uh, online attending uh, audience, you have already interest in the topic. So I think it's our challenge to meet the expectations of the audience that we have here. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, what are we going to talk about during this panel today? We're going to talk about the particularities of corporates and startups and the way they collaborate. Does it make sense that corporates and startups do collaborate? <laughs> Speakers will, will tell me if uh, <laughs> will tell us if that's a, a reason that la raison d'être for these uh, for these collaborations. Um, also, are those collaborations reshaping the traditional business models that we have within the mobility sector? Which challenges do we face to make these collaborations long lasting? Um, or, for example, what are the key success factors to make these collaborations indeed long lasting? My name is Rolf Aliu, as already introduced, I'm the Startup Scrum Manager at the EIT, European Mobility, and we are an organization connecting almost 900 players within the mobility sector all over Europe. Indeed, corporations and startups are two of the groups that we intend to connect, and this topic of the session is really, really interesting, at least for me, because I would like to know a bit more. I'm not going to delay and need more because we have um, the panelists here that will nourish this uh, conversation. So I'm going to go straight into the introductions. If that's okay, I present you with the name of your position and you give one minute introduction about yourself and what is relating you to collaboration between startups and corporates. Let's start maybe with uh, Julia de Pedro, head of building and strategy at Build. Yeah. So, uh, Jana is super pleased to be here with all of you. So, um, I work in Build. Build is a corporate venture builder. I don't know if you are uh, you are familiar with this uh, new new way of doing um, innovation uh, in in the corporative uh, arena, but uh, we create new businesses with big corporations, um, having them as a as a partner. Of the of the new startup uh, that we are creating, and um, we uh, have the foundation is that we um, leverage like the assets that the corporations um, have 
and um, we we try like to put them like in order like to scale up the new the new business the new venture. We are agnostic in in industry and um, we we have created several things in mobility. So we are uh, yeah we, we know also this uh, this industry and this topic. Fantastic. That is all. Fantastic yeah. to have you here, Julia. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now let's move to Diego Gea. Uh, he is the startup ecosystem leader at Capgemini Ventures. Tell us a bit about what you're doing. Thank you so much for having us here and having me, of course. Um, I don't know if uh, somebody here knows about Capgemini. Um, we are um, um, 11,000 employees in, uh, in Spain and 350. Uh, thousand um, uh, employees around the world. So uh, to have uh, an idea, we are three times the number of employees that, for example, uh, a Spanish company like Mercadona has in Spain. Uh, we are an IT consultancy specialized in, 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 in a lot of sectors, such as um, mobility, industry, um, and, uh, and energy, for example. And uh, we have different ways to collaborate with startups. One is uh, throughout our uh, fund in, uh, in France called ESAI. And uh, a second way to collaborate with the startups is throughout partnerships. We have uh, 200 of partnerships currently ongoing around the world and a lot of uh, companies uh, scouted in, in the entire world. So it is my main purpose here to scout um, uh, innovative solutions that could fit with our st corporate strategy and also um, that has uh, already a solution already tested in the market. Thank you, Diego. Indeed, uh, we're very looking forward to know the corporation point of view on this type of collaboration with the startups. And the startups uh, came into the last place, last but not least, right? Mm -hmm. Candence. Uh, so can we have here Candence Safri, CEO and founder of Via Power. Tell us a bit what you do. Thank you. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Uh, yeah, so my name is Candice, uh, founder and CEO of BIA. And uh, yeah, we started BIA uh, about five years ago here in Barcelona. Uh, we're a startup that focuses on uh, electric mobility. So we work on uh, a software that helps electric vehicles charge in an optimal way. So we look at everything from uh, optimizing the cost of the charge, the cost of the infrastructure, and also how sustainable the charge is. So we make it cheaper and cleaner to uh, power electric vehicles. So my background has been in startup, um, everything, I sp I've spent over 15 years in startup in the Silicon Valley, and then the last five years here in uh, Barcelona. And uh, this company is a B2B SaaS, so we work with corporations on both sides. So we want to mm -hmm. sell <laughs> to corporates, and then we also want to partner with corporates for scaling. So uh, we have, uh, I think, both sides of the coin as far as our go-to-market. Good. Fantastic, thanks. So let's maybe start with you, Candence, because um, I would like to get the point of view, which I think is very interesting also for the audience, on how can startups make this collaboration with corporates uh, agile? And uh, maybe a biased question, why do you need each other? Maybe you tell me, no, we don't need each other. Let's, let's, fi let's figure it out. Um, so can you quickly put into context be a power way of collaboration with corporates, maybe by addressing the differences with collaborations with public administrations mm -hmm. um, and highlighting the advantages you might find when collaborating with corporates? Sure. So there's yeah, there's definitely a number of advantages, and there's I would call them a number of, of challenges that uh, you know it helps to be aware of and to actually just uh, develop into your your process plan. So do we need each other? A hundred percent. So when you're a startup, you've got sure you have a lot of agility, you have um, a really good pulse on what's coming next in the market, uh, what products the customers are really asking for, and you have the ability to meet that. Uh, very quickly, like we run two in, two week sprints, for example, I can have a feature out in like under two weeks. So I think that there's this really adaptable uh, product strategy that's uh, you know that really almost only a, a, a startup is very capable of. Uh, but to go to market and to also get the credibility for the market, we need uh, we we need the corporate relationship. So the corporate relationship brings to us um, access to scale. Um, and it also brings us uh, access to brand credibility. So both of those things are really important uh, for a startup. 
And uh, I think that we've had, um, uh, over, the, over the last couple of years, and actually over my career, some that have worked really, really well, and some that just remain, uh, remain challenges. Um, so I think, yeah, I don't know if you want me to go into that more, but. Um. You can elaborate more if you want. Maybe um, one follow-up question on what you mentioned about, okay, it can take us two weeks to develop a new feature. Mm -hmm. uh, so how can you um, cope this agility with when collaborating with a large corporation which usually has more heavy processes? Mm -hmm. How do you find the right balance here? Patience. I think you need a lot of patience. <laughs> so, yeah, it's interesting. People often think, oh, you know, there's... The, the reasons that we need each other is that the startup is super fast and that the corporate, the corporate needs uh, access to uh, agility. I don't know if it's that. I think one layer deeper is that um, the startup has really good strategic insights from customers and that's what the corporate needs. So the fact that I can release features in a week or two weeks actually isn't that important to the, to the corporate and it's really good for a startup to get that really you know, deeply understood. When you're, when you're working in a corporate environment now, they can, you know, they can see two years as very fast, <laughs> right? So I think it's it's setting expectations. So let's make sure you understand like what is core to this, um, what do I bring that's core to the ov overall strategy of the corporate? And one thing I've learned over the years as well is a lot of times you end up going into like an innovation center in, within the corporate. So they say, this is our innovation group, we wanna do a pilot. And that's where I think you get stuck in this sort of death by a thousand pilots. Um, so for me I've, I, and for BIA, we've really worked hard to get into core corporate so that what, you know, maybe we have a hundred features, but three of them are super relevant for their core strategy. That's the module I'm gonna really push within a corporate so that right away I have operationally relevant tech and I'm not talking about, oh, the future and the next 10 years, because that's going to be an innovation forever. So it's really good to get into core corporate strategy, really release and, and even just open the window to the pieces of your product that make a lot of sense today that have operational relevance, and then you can start to have real projects. Great. Thanks for, for the contribution. And I hope, I, I would like to take this as, a, okay, you see this correlation as needed. And now maybe compared with Diego on the corporate side, uh, mm -hmm. I hope that you also agree that this collaboration is needed uh, because sometimes, as I said, uh, corporates are some, sometimes seen as more bureaucratic, uh, heavy, so yes. to speak. Um, and uh, by referring to the pilot mentioned that you made contents, um, sorry, 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 let me get back to the script. Um, okay, yeah, again, the comparison between more agility and maybe more heavy process from the corporate side. So how does Capgemini, and you being the head of innovation, deal with or try not to slow down innovation within your, your, your organization specifically? Okay, cool. Um, uh, first of all, uh, just for the record, we are not the dark side, because you said the other side. <laughs> <laughs> we are not the dark well, side. Well, we might be the dark side. <laughs> so, um, in, in fact, <coughs> uh, Maybe it's interesting for this conversation. I had my own business uh, some years ago, mm -hmm. so I have both perspectives uh, to to try to um, uh, to bring this uh, this topic on the table. Um, I partially disagree with the assumption that uh, corporates are slower than than startups. <coughs> uh, in fact, um, we w in in our case uh, we were not able to 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 b uh, to be fast enough to change our uh, value proposal fast enough uh, that we ran out of cash, so we, we died in the way. Um, so the assumption that um, uh, startups are faster than, than others, I mean, maybe developing the solution, yes, I agree, but um, only developing the solution is not the, um, mm -hmm. the key of the, of the success. In fact, in Capgemini, we understand um, that the offering is the main success. Being fast of the, in the offering in the time to market is the key success um, um, <laughs> of adapting uh, the solutions to, uh, to the market. Maybe we can remember some sentence that Steve Jobs said that we should start from the business needs and then move backward uh, in the technology. A lot of startups failed uh, in the way uh, trying to spend on money and technology um, if they didn't uh, validate before the solution to the market. So I partially disagree that um, corporate set are slower than, than startups. Um, but I should say also one thing that 
this kind of collaborations uh, make sense in, in one step. It is impossible being an expert in all the fields, like people, it is impossible being an expert, uh, a perfect husband, a perfect uh, father, a perfect uh, employee or entrepreneur, every time. And in corporates, it's the same in, in, in every way. So uh, maybe this is the, the, um, the piece of the puzzle that um, uh, a startup can bring to the corporate, being specialized in, in a specific niche to complete the offering that Capgemini, for example, can't afford to bring to the final customers. Um, and also, uh, I believe, in fact, that we are very fast <laughs> offering the, um, the, 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 the right solutions to our, to our current uh, customers. In, I can bring some to, uh, to this topic, um, two examples. Uh, one is um, one big corporate here in Spain, uh, a, telecom a telecommunications one, requested to us directly to add a specific solution from a startup in, in an offer because they told us that um, they wanted to add this, um, uh, this startup in the offering because it was the fastest way to introduce in, in their corporate. So it is um, a, a success history that happened uh, some months ago and also probably a second one now that we are in the mobility round table. Yes. Um, some uh, months ago, uh, maybe weeks, um, we have an opportunity in, in Germany. Um, we have a big hub of mobility there. And um, we were offering a solution to migrate uh, some servers to a hybrid cloud solution. And during that time, we won the, the, the deal. But just after this, um, this uh, big deal, the uh, customer decided to add a new bullet to add some sustainability uh, features in the, um, in the offering. So quickly, we decided to, to start working, uh, finding great solutions around uh, hybrid cloud um, solutions in Germany. And we started working with, um, with a startup that built their own servers inside wind turbines. So it was a success history that happened um, some, uh, some months ago. So I mean, in, in that sense, I think that uh, corporates will fit very well with uh, startups finding specific solutions for a specific problem. And it is very difficult being an expert in, in all fields. Absolutely, any contributions from <laughs> the uh, attendees? I mean, uh, having the two examples is fantastic from a large corporation. Also the disagreement <laughs> on uh, being a slow mover as uh, the corporation. Yes. <laughs> uh, so it's as long as it's a healthy discussion, we welcome it. Uh, now maybe let's cut the point of view of the bench building activities from Build from yeah. Julia. Um, because uh, we started with a startup, uh, we went up with a corporation. Um, so what are the, the, the key ingredients you would say when connecting corporates to new business to be made yeah. uh, in order to have this win-win uh, yeah. collaboration and long-lasting one? Yeah, because our approach is, is um, slightly different uh, from the open innovation because you, you take something that is created in the market and you connect it with a big corporation. But we create the thing, the whole thing from a scratch uh, with the corporation. So, um, and we as a venture builder, uh, we have the methodology, we have all the experience, we have all the um, expertise like in failing fast and uh, on top of that, uh, like minimizing the risk. So um, I, I brought some figures with me because I, th I think they are uh, really interesting. The 90% of the startups uh, fail uh, but uh, the most interesting in this figure is not the total amount, but like the mix, uh, like the, if we dig in into like the causes of this failure, we can see that uh, on one hand, they, they have some problems with the financing uh, side, uh, they lack of finance, but in, in the second place, uh, maybe they don't have like the market fit, so they, they struggle like to, to, be, to have this, um, this fit. Um, 
they, they can be swept away from competitors by competitors, so they, they don't have like the capacity to, uh, to compete in equal uh, uh, terms than uh, others um, in the market. Uh, and, and that is something, and, and of course, they can lack of the business model fit. So, and, and the solution of this is that the corporations uh, have different assets that working together with this new business model uh, can make them absolutely um, successful. I, I can um, uh, name a few of them, for example, uh, 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 investment muscle for, for sure, but customers, but industrial knowledge, uh, intellectual property, uh, know how and know who. They, they have like a big uh, network of, of providers of uh, different uh, stakeholders that um, um, accelerate everything in, in a massive way. So, and we as a venture builder, we, we only uh, make it possible. We have the methodology, we have like a big team of builders that uh, build uh, these new ventures. We are really, really fast validating new businesses because um, what we have seen is that um, uh, sometimes uh, startups uh, don't uh, start from a bis uh, like uh, from a pain from the customer, a, a, a deep pain. So I mean, there is not like a problem solution fit or maybe market fit. And um, they, they uh, launch really fast something to the market, they put it in, into the market, but the market doesn't want that. So, and we make sure that we follow like a, a process uh, to like to check all the intermediate steps in order to kill the thing or to scale up the thing. So, and we are like really objective with that. Yes, indeed kind of go, goes aligned with you, you quote of a Steve Jobs, right? Uh, that we have <laughs> yes. to go to the market first to know what are the, the pains to then uh, create the, the business together. Mm. Um, I wanted to know, Julia, um, uh, and how is the approach that you take with corporations? So is that corporations coming to build and saying, okay, we would like to do some open innovation or we have an open innovation department, but we have not landed anything. Yeah. Uh, what is the usual um, first contact you have? That is a good question because I think that uh, it all depends on the maturity level of the corporation because um, as I've seen is that they, they can start from a less, um, I don't know how to say these tight or, or engagement models or engaged models that implies a corporate venture building. They start from a smooth models like open innovation, venture client, making some pilots uh, with, um, with uh, little specific needs and little startups. Maybe they can do some uh, accelerations uh, programs or uh, maybe they, they have a venture capital, they put some money with uh, small tickets in, in some uh, um, startups. And um, like, uh, for example, entrepreneurship programs or whatever. So they can do that, but from that to a venture builder or, or, or to mm, skate into a venture building thing is like, a, there is a, like a big step. So uh, when we start uh, speaking with a corporation, we start from a territory that is an opportunity. Maybe we know that um, obesity is like the, the next uh, big thing in health, or maybe uh, fintech, or maybe like uh, last mile, uh, like uh, logistics, for example, or mobility, uh, like um, uh, urban mobility, for, for example. So they know uh, that they want to tackle uh, a territory, but they don't know how to do it, because if they know that if they put it into the uh, like uh, corporative um, world and processes, they are going to kill it because they don't have focus, they, are no, they don't have the resources, they don't have the entrepreneur uh, talent, and they don't know how to do it. So it's like we start the conversations from the opportunity area, and uh, from that point, we move into like this process of eight months, more or less, to have like the, the business validated and ready to be launched. So. Very, very interesting approach indeed uh, on venture building to, to maybe narrow these collaborations between a startup and corporate. So 
In fact, maybe we can agree after the first interventions that uh, yes, it is needed. Of course, of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe now let's talk about um, how can we beat the odds uh, on a startup corporate collaborations to make this really successful on the long term. Um, and Condense, uh, you, you mentioned uh, the, the starting point of some of your, your projects with via pilots. And um, indeed, at uh, EAT Urban Mobility, we also intend to uh, facilitate these collaborations and we even fund some pilots uh, linking corporates and uh, startups. Um, uh, in, in humble opinion, the challenge comes after the pilot is ended. Because mm -hmm. uh, basically, even if uh, hitting the KPIs or the targets, sometimes the continuation of the pilot into a contract is not granted. I wanted to know um, your opinion on how can these relations survive beyond the pilot phase. <laughs> and um, yeah, so not to stay only on the hype of a collaboration between a big mm -hmm. corporation and an innovative solution from a startup. How can you overcome this to, to beat the odds indeed mm -hmm. for the long-term collaboration? I think that it, it goes down to who you're doing the collaboration with and where the product market fit is. So if you're doing a pilot, and it's up to the startup to, you know, you can, you can get a pilot with most corporations, but I think it's important because you only have so much bandwidth, and that's what we're, that's a huge resource for a startup to be very careful with, is your bandwidth and your, and your, and your time to commercial market. So I think the responsibility to start is on the startup to make sure that you're picking the right pilot. And picking the right pilot means that you're working with a corporation that your product is going to be an easy fit into their core market. So you're not bringing them something that you think is going to be amazing in 10 years and you know that's something that's really disruptive. I mean, it could be very disruptive, but it, that it doesn't have relevance today. So I think the startup needs to understand the corporate that they're working with very well and understand um, that there is within that existing strategy in the corporate, there is a place for them and for their product. Um, because if it isn't, then you do a pilot. Like you said, you can hit your KPIs. It can be a successful pilot. But if there wasn't already a commercial strategy around it, it stays in innovation. And innovation is where you know, uh, things don't actually uh, you know, move, in, in move into corporate that often. So the ones that move from innovation into corporate are the ones that have a line strategy on the product market uh, phase. So, for me, that's what you know. Over, over you know many years doing this, I feel like it's it's the res the responsibility of the startup. I know my product well. I can figure out yours. You know your website's clear, and I can <laughs> see where you've been successful. That's more obvious than than it is on the startup side. So it's really up to me to say I'm picking pilots that make sense for the long term. That that is operational today. So not something that you know we've worked on pilots that. I already know the market's five or ten years out. I know that they just want this to say that they tried something and that they have it, you know, they have a, a little flagship pilot saying that they're also part of the new stuff. That's not as interesting as, as getting into really core strategy. I find it very interesting that you mentioned that you, you can pick the pilots that you really think are worth investing <laughs> the time resources. Um, and how, how does this usually work? Because uh, is it uh, uh, corporate stressing you to host a pilot first, validate the technology, and then go for a contract? Do you receive direct requests for services that are, in fact, uh, converted into a contract when you mm -hmm. agree to terms and conditions? How does this first approach with corporates work? I think there, there's there's probably two main ways. One is there's a lot of, um, what I, I guess we call like accelerator programs or, uh, you know, you know the, the big corporates, you can name them in energy or in mobility, they want all the startups to come in and sort of compete for a pilot or show their, um, you know, de demonstrate their, their, their roadmap or their technology. Um, and those are the ones that I think unfortunately don't work as well. Um, because basically you're lining up against all your competitors, giving all your IP and, and then, uh, you know, you're very exposed and you don't have like a real link to what's happening. They really, that's where I think it's more, it's smart for the, for the corporate, but not as uh, great on, on, the, on the startup side. And it ends up going back to resource, which is bandwidth. It really takes a lot of time. You have to go through applications, you have to go through presentations, and you have of to fill course. out all the forms, and then you gotta do, you gotta travel there, oh my God. No. <laughs> Sorry, I've done it too many times. Um, <laughs> But, and then you might win, and then even if you win, then it's like a special project that is saying, oh, we get to do this now. So I think that's one way. The other way is I go after the corporate. So I know I want to work with that corporate. I know that they are in touch with the customers I want to be in touch with, and I go to them and say, I'm going to give you a pilot. I'm going to give you six months free. I'm going to show you my tech works. I'm going to show you and make a difference to you because I, I know who I want to go after from a product perspective. So I think it's, yeah, the ones that come to me are a little bit more... 
Um, they, they take longer, they're a little bit more about um, demonstration and actually, you know, if you have enough startups around, you are basically giving all your IP and ideas to the corporate for that free. <laughs> <laughs> Diego, he has something to, to add maybe on the startup or the way you proceed with startups. Do you really or usually embrace this collaboration first with a pilot? Uh, um, yes. How do you have this first point of contact with the startups? Yes, um, in our case, um, just before uh, making uh, any pilot, uh, um, we made a deep health check of the uh, of the situation of the financials of the um, uh, of the startup, because um, we need uh, solutions already tested in the market, okay. and uh, it is important being honest on what is inside uh, the um, inside the, the the cloud of the sales and the rest of the company. So it is important to open the door and uh, to understand what is happening inside the, um, inside the company, the ambitions of the founders, because um, the attitude of the, of, the, of the founders, it is very important to know uh, what they expect of, um, uh, in the future, because we always uh, want to grow. So first of all, we make a deep uh, health check together with our team uh, from India and the rest of, the, um, and the rest of Europe. And second one, we start um, testing the, the pilots in our own labs. We have 90 labs around the world. Uh, one of them here in Spain, probably the biggest one. And um, currently, for example, we have between 20 and 30 solutions uh, that are currently being tested in, the, in that lab. We uh, more or less test um, 40 or uh, 50 solutions each year there. So this is the first step after bringing the solutions to the to the final customer. Of course, if, if the pilot is uh, successful, uh, we show um, um, the pilot to the to the customer, and then we start the conversations, bringing the solution to the specific offer. Um, in our case, regarding to the first topic about uh, velocity, um, those steps only happens between one or two months. So we are very fast uh, making the health check and testing the solution in our own labs. I'm not going to mention anymore that corporates are slow. That's <laughs> clear you, you stated very clear that you have a smooth process to yes. test the solutions, even on the risk mitigation side, to lower the risk when you are engaging with new startups with these analysis that you were referring to. Quite interesting. Um, uh, then on the... On what about the end of the project or the end of the collaboration? When you can determine that the collaboration with a startup has been successful? Is it via KPIs? Is it via the target of the project? Do you take a very quantified approach or is it more abstract on the values that can provide to Capgemini and the client? Um, I don't have a specific answer for that, but uh, if the um, relationship uh, grows, um, we have a fund in, in, uh, in France uh, called ISAI, so if the cooperation in, uh, grows, we are open to invest in the companies. Uh, we passed the, um, the relationship to the um, uh, acquisitions uh, department. So maybe um, another department uh, start the conversation with them to try to um, build even more synergies than uh, a specific offer or a specific uh, proof of, com of, of, of concept. It goes one step uh, beyond, right? Uh, apart from collaboration for pilot or a contract specific interest, then the startup may become part of Capgemini, at least with a little share of the investment that you make in exchange for equity. So that's, yes. I, I, I see this as a very interesting approach. Um, maybe this also links to the venture building activities when you create a new company that the shares have to be distributed between the client being the corporate, maybe a bill itself, the founders of the startup. Um, Maybe some insights here, otherwise I have uh, one question prepared, which is um, how do you uh, address with the methodology the, the common pitfalls that you can find with uh, corporations addressing innovation and willing to create a new startup uh, within the organization, yeah. outside the organization, let us say? 
I would say that there are two factors in that are really interesting in this point. That the first one is that uh, the corporation has to um, trust us as a venture builder uh, to, to leave us do the thing outside of the, comp of the corporation. Because if they want like, to, uh, to take part and to make the decisions and to interfere like, during the creation process, it's not going to work. So we work as a partners, but in some point, the corporation is a kind of a spectator. So it's like uh, he uh, sees everything because we have like a weekly uh, that we share all the status of the of the creation of the of the business, but uh, they respect uh, deeply uh, the work that we do. So and they give us independence to do the thing. That is one thing that is important. But the territory that I was mentioning, the, the, like the start point of the, of the process, is really important that it's not an area super strategic uh, for the corporation, because if, they, uh, if it is really sticked uh, to, the, um, to the core business, they will want like to have it like in, in inside the corporation. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, this is mine. It's like Gollum, the, my treasure. I want this like a business unit, but we need, we make, uh, we need to make sure that we give it uh, um, enough independence. So we, we uh, need to preserve it outside of the, of the corporation. And of course, we have something that is um, not and really and unique. Question, is it independence in the form of the constitution of the company, independence in the form of the way the startup is going to operate when compared yeah. to the big corporation? Yeah, the okay. processes and, and like in, in independence, like in choosing or picking like the, the like the concepts, because we have like different phases from market discovery, problem discovery, solution discovery, uh, validation and the building plan or business plan. So from the, the first stage that we are creating like the solution concept, they, they cannot uh, interfere in terms, okay, I like this most, or maybe I think that we have this interest uh, inside the company so we can uh, match uh, uh, both of them. So we, we, we need to preserve that independence. So, and, and the last one, the, the last one thing is, um, once we have validated the concept and we uh, we know we have designed like the business plan because we only build the business plans um, once we have validated the thing because all the hypotheses all the kpis all the numbers uh, we need um yeah we, we need to take it from the from the ground yeah from the like uh, the, uh, the experience uh, validating so the the once we have created this uh, building plan, we take two or three months uh, negotiating the whole ventures agreement, aligning all the incentives and the different parts, uh, the entrepreneur uh, team build part, and, and of course the corporation part. And we, uh, we, have, we work as a team, so it's like we discuss everything and we uh, make sure that we are fully aligned uh, in, in, the, in the most uh, important topics. Um, and we uh, decide if we need uh, extra funds, if we need to go there outside like to look for the investments, and we can do that as, a, as build. But yes, we, we take our time to uh, clarify everything because we don't, we don't need uh, any misunderstanding that stops uh, like the scaling up of the, of the new venture. So it's like a, some diversification that is outside of the core business, that is one of the messages. And the second one is like independence, and of course, uh, like taking our time to align everything. Because uh, if we don't, don't do that, we are, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Interesting uh, to have seen the three perspectives on how to beat the odds on these uh, long-lasting collaborations between startups and corporates. Um, I have to do some time management here, so we have four or five more minutes. And I would like to close the panel with a couple of short questions mm -hmm. with one sentence answer for each one of you. Um, the first one, and uh, maybe let's start with Candace. Candace uh, what is the biggest myth about corporate and startup collaborations? And in your opinion, how can we bust it? 
I think that um, one of them may be that we've said a couple times today that and we, it's sort of a broad statement that corporates need startup. And I would say that corporates need startups ideas. So I think that it's really important for a startup to understand that, that these companies are very successful for a reason. Mm -hmm. They actually have the resources to do what they want to do, but they can't sometimes access the customer or the niches in the market like you can. So don't think that they're, they're, they're there for you, they're there for your, the success of your startup, they're there to access your ideas and your, and your product, your agility and your product. If you understand that, then I think you'll have a really strong positive relationship because you'll know what's best and, and you know, why both parties are into it and you know how to manage the relationship. So I think it's corporates, are, corporates need startup ideas is probably the better way to finish it. Good. And Diego, myth yes. and how to bust it? Maybe you already know that uh, the myth is that corporates are... <laughs> I know you <laughs> so We'll talk later. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think that um, the key of the success of these kind of collaborations is, is the time to market, to choose the, mm -hmm. the, the right, right time product. to offer the solution to the market and then move by, uh, backward to the, to the technology mm -hmm. and um, executing the solution. Great. Thanks, and Julia, myth, and how to bust it. Um, yeah, I was thinking about this one because I, 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 I don't know, but I think that one of the main myths that I, I can, I constantly hear is that uh, all the startups are uh, um, targeting to be unicorns and they survive because they rise like investment, uh, like funding rounds that are. Uh, infinite and they are doing the thing uh, every time. So I think that that is a myth because uh, a unicorn is like one in a million. And um, the most of the startups uh, live uh, like not PMEs, but uh, small and medium enterprises, but they have this mindset of surviving like with their, their own operations. So it's like they don't uh, want like to have like uh, um, uh, many uh, funding rounds, uh, or sorry, uh, financing rounds. Um, and, and I see true businesses, not uh, like uh, this romantic idea of unicorns. So um, I constantly see that, that they are like real businesses and they, they try to finance them with uh, their own operations. And of course, small amounts of, of funding or, or financing that they need from banks or from public funds or, or even uh, from investors. But mm, it, that is not like the, the, the yeah, this dream of, of uh, being a unicorn is not, <laughs> it's not true. Well, I, think so. I, ho I hope that here at least we have one of the startups of that course, can make it to, to the unicorn <laughs> status. But uh, you know, the 99% of the unicorns uh, fail, mm -hmm. like eventually. So let's go so for this 1%. Yeah, I don't, don't know, know if I want to wish you <laughs> to be a unicorn. <laughs> Maybe it's not. I don't even think they're real. You don't think that unicorn. they're real? <laughs> Indeed, you, you tell me. Is the unicorn real? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. This has been a very interesting ex exchange. We have seen the three perspectives from the bench builder, corporate, and also startup on this type of relations from startups and uh, corporates. And we did not have any time for questions. In any case, uh, we'll be here around the, the event, uh, which has a fantastic setup. Even the, the studio itself is, is amazing. So mm -hmm. that's, again, a thanks for the organization, for the factory, and for the attendees, uh, Julia De Pedro from Build, thank you. Uh, Diego Gea from Capgemini, and Candente Steffi from Via Power. Thank you very much. Thank and you. that's a wrap up the session. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, thank you uh, for sharing with us your knowledge about uh, this uh, mobility and this collaboration uh, between the startups and the corporates. So thank you for coming. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Gracias por moderar esta, esta sesión. Nosotros concluimos aquí esta bueno, vertical de mobility en la que durante dos días hemos ido pues, dando datos y detalles de cómo se puede ir avanzando hacia esa movilidad más sostenible. Ahora lo veíamos eh, con ellos sobre cómo es tan importante también la colaboración entre las empresas y, y las startups y también hemos ido comentando pues, la importancia de la colaboración público-privada para avanzar en este sentido 
sentido. Cerramos así este plato de Mobility con todos los datos que hemos ido recopilando a lo largo de estos días sobre el presente y el futuro de esta movilidad más sostenible por el bien, pues no solo de las ciudades, sino también por el bien de, de la salud y de la reducción de la contaminación. Ahora bien, mañana eh, arrancaremos con una novedad en este sentido, que va a ser el plato de Aviation. Vamos a hablar de aviación, de cómo es esa movilidad también, pero a nivel aéreo. Así que de esta manera nosotros cerramos este plato de Mobility en esta segunda jornada. Recuerdan que el Vinew es un espacio pues, para transformar, conectar también y precisamente lo que se ha hecho hoy aquí, impulsar pues, nuevos modelos de, de negocio. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos y les esperamos mañana. Gracias a ustedes también y gracias por moderar esta sesión. Muchas gracias. Fabricamos talento, fabricamos innovación y, cómo no, sostenibilidad. Fabricamos una nueva economía y un mundo nuevo, en 3D, por supuesto. Pero, sobre todo, fabricamos futuro. Y es que fabricamos empleo para más de 137.000 trabajadores. Fabricamos oportunidades globales de negocio en un espacio de más de 10 millones de metros cuadrados. Y fabricamos servicios de vanguardia y ventajas competitivas para más de 175 empresas. Consorcio de la Zona Franca. Fabricamos oportunidades para tu futuro. Bienvenidos a The Factory Barcelona, la fábrica de, de talento, de tecnología, de innovación y, por supuesto, de Barcelona. Y es que The Factory consolida a Barcelona como la capital europea de la industria 4.0, de la digitalización, de la transformación, creando en la ciudad 1.500 puestos de trabajo directos y 5.000 indirectos, cerca del metro, del puerto y del aeropuerto. E impulsada por el Consorcio de la Zona Franca de Barcelona. Barcelona activa conecta Juan buscas feina o formació Juan vols emprendre o impulsar el teu negoci Conecta amb Barcelona activa i aconsegueix els teus reptes professionals Descobreix com a barcelonaactiva.cat Barcelona és desconectar És volar Barcelona és descobrir És compartir Barcelona és tocar el cielo Barcelona es parar el tiempo. Barcelona es vida. Es amar. Barcelona es única. Es un montón de likes. ¿Qué Barcelona conoces tú? Descúbrelas todas en barcelonaesmuchomás.es Por fin un banco que trata a las empresas como personas. Ibercaja, el banco del vamos. Más de 314 millones de pasajeros han pasado por los aeropuertos del Grupo AENA en España y en el mundo. Un 23% más que en 2019, antes de la pandemia y anterior récord, y un 16% más que en 2022. En AENA hemos vuelto a demostrar que los nuestros son los aeropuertos más seguros, eficientes, sostenibles y acogedores del mundo. Catalizadores de la economía y el turismo. AENA. Aeropuertos para ti.